I'm going to turn it over to you, Elisa, and thank you so much for doing this program for us. Thank you, Laura, and it is just my pleasure. And good morning, everybody. It's uh, good to good to be with you, albeit virtually. Um, so I'm I'm pleased to be able to present this subject in connection with Sarasota's Sarasota counties, I should say, uh, centennial. Uh, I think it's important to remember the important people in Sarasota's history and Bertha Palmer is certainly one of them that, that had a huge impact on, uh, on Sarasota. And the connection between Bertha Palmer and the Ringling's Art Library is because of the fact that the library's rare book collection houses and includes Bertha Palmer's library that she had in her home here in Osprey, uh, south of Sarasota. Um, so this talk today will begin by presenting some biographical background about Bertha Palmer because her life is just so fascinating. It's, it's, it's a treat to hear about. And then I'm going to go on to discuss uh, the gardening books that were in, in particular that are in the collection because most of the books that we do have that were Bertha Palmer's have to do with gardening. Some have to do with interior design, but primarily gardening. Um, so in terms of the history of, of how we happen to acquire Bertha's, uh, Bertha Palmer's books, we're not really sure how that happened. Uh, we think that it was because they were given to the library by her grandson, Gordon, the son of Potter Palmer II, but again, it's speculation. And at that time, the museum at Spanish Point uh, did not exist. So there were no archives and no, no sort of collection of any of her objects. So they probably thought, the Palmer family probably thought that it would be a safe place for her books to, to find their home after her death. A number of the books in our collection have Ms. Palmer's signature in them. Uh, and in terms of, of the subject of gardening, most have to do with either English or Italian gardens. So this may reflect Bertha Palmer's particular interests. Many of them are published in London, um, and she probably purchased them during the eight years when she spent part of the year in London, uh, again, after the death of her husband. Bertha Palmer came to Sarasota in 1910 and became one of the city's most prominent businesswomen and pioneers. She was a leader in real estate development, owning 80,000 acres, including much of the land that um, went alongside what is today Bee Ridge Road in Sarasota. Uh, the slide that you see here is uh, one of the early settlements on Bee Ridge. Looks quite different than it does today. Um, and then further out uh, were the two ranches that she owned. And one was um, Meadow Sweet Pastures. And the second one was uh, in what is now Mayaka State Park. Um, and so these two 2,000 acres were donated by her sons to the state of Florida uh, so that we could today have, have Mayaka State Park. This is a picture from her cattle ranch in Mayaka. Uh, as a cattle rancher and a cattle breeder, she was the first one to dip cattle in Florida for tick-borne diseases. She was also the first one to use barbed wire fencing. Uh, she, did, she was so heavily into to breeding cattle that could survive the Florida climate and the ticks here that she didn't want her cattle sort of mingling with the, the riffraff in, in uh, Arcadia. So she, she wanted them kept separate and, and the other ranchers were not happy about that at all. Um, she was also one of the very few female members of the Florida State Livestock Association, probably another factor that irritated her male uh, colleagues in, in other ranches. And she also had celery and tomato farms. So if you're familiar with the area around Fruitful Public Library, um, you'll have seen that area. They're still called the celery fields. And as a matter of fact, by the 1920s, she had the third largest celery farm in Florida. 
and it was her son Honoré, which is where we get the name for the street here in Sarasota, uh, came to take care of the farming aspect of her business. She also established a gorgeous home and estate in Osprey, where she created a magnificent garden that blended with the area's lush natural flora. She bought 350 acres on what is today Little Sarasota Bay, and she called it the Oaks. The site of her home is built, or the home no longer exists, but it was built on one of the most ancient areas of Florida going back about 5,000 years. And this was um, the, evidenced by the uh, Native American midden that still exists there um, at um, the Oaks. Uh, and it, it was one of the, and is one of the oldest in the Southeastern United States. Um, and it probably was located there because of the abundance of, of seafood and the ecosystem that was available to the uh, people living there at that time. Bertha Honoré was born in 1849 in Louisville, Kentucky, the daughter of a prominent real estate developer who moved his family to Chicago when Bertha was six, uh, six weeks, or excuse me, six years old. She was educated at a convent school in Georgetown and then returned to Chicago where she made her debut. But she was only 13 years old when she first met Potter Palmer. And of course, he was a very, very successful businessman, one of the richest men in, um, in America. He was the innovator of the largest mercantile business in the Midwest, and that went on to become Marshall Fields department store. Um, and a, a lot of his innovations contributed to his success. For example, he emphasized customer service, he offered store credit, and he was the first one to, do, to, um, to have a bargain basement in his store, which was a huge success. Um, apparently, it was love at first sight for Potter Palmer, but as I said, Bertha Palmer was only, or Bertha Honoré was only 13 at the time. So looking at that situation with our eyes today, we might think that's a little peculiar, but they did go on to marry. Uh, she was 21 and he was 44 at the time, and their wedding took place across the street from the Chicago Art Institute, which is significant because they amassed a huge collection of French Impressionist paintings, and those paintings later went to the Chicago Art Institute. Potter Palmer's wedding present to Bertha was the Palmer House Hotel in Chicago. It cost $35 million to build, but uh, unfortunately it burned down shortly after they had moved in and a new Palmer house was built advertised appropriately as the world's only fireproof hotel. So the Palmers lived there for a number of years before they moved into a neo-Romanesque, neo-Gothic uh, style structure that looked a lot like a castle. It was completed in 1884 at the cost of a million dollars. And after they had moved in, they had kings and politicians and famous people from all over the world visiting them there. It was the largest uh, house ever built in Chicago. Uh, and remember that this was a, a million dollars in, um, in the late 1800s. And John Ringling, when he built Catazan that was completed in 1928, uh, spent a million and a half. Uh, so a uh, million dollars at that time was quite an expensive home. If you look at the slide, the photograph on the bottom, you'll see that from almost floor to ceiling, they're displaying the uh, collection they have of French 19th century painting. And the uh, photograph on the upper right hand corner is of um, uh, the library and uh, in Renaissance style and they also the house also included a 75 foot ballroom so it was quite grand. This is a photograph of Bertha Palmer in 1893 by which time she was known as the queen, <clears throat> excuse me, of Chicago. And she looks 
every bit the part with the, the crown and everything. Uh, in addition to being Chicago's royalty and her most and its most famous hostess, she was also a musician, a linguist, an art collector, as I said, and a women's rights activist who worked primarily for the fair treatment of women in hospitals, women and children in hospitals and in poor houses. And she also worked to organize unions for women and to establish kindergartens for the, for the children of women who had to work in factories and, and other places. Um, and this is where you're going to have to bear with me for a moment because I am totally uh, captivated by her wardrobe. I mean, I always think it's interesting to look at what people wore it in, in former times, but she really outdid herself. And fortunately, the um, Chicago History Museum has a lot of her, her wardrobe still, and they have it on display there. So I'm just going to show you a, a few of these pieces because I think you'll be quite amazed. Um, this is one of the gowns uh, by her favorite designer, Worth of Paris. And of course, she she maintained a home in Paris for a number of years. So she would she would uh, uh, add to her wardrobe when she was there, and then bring them back to Chicago to Chicago to warp to uh, really wow people. Um, she wore this particular gown to various events at the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Here are another couple of her gowns. Um, the one on the right is also by Worth, and she had it designed for her presentation at the Court of St. James. Uh, apparently the court dictated every detail of what a woman was supposed to wear when they were being presented at court, the color, the style, and so forth. And this one had a nine foot train that you could detach from the, the gown itself. The last outfit I want to show you is one that I, I find just incredible uh, because of the fact that it weighed so much when she wore it. It's made out of velvet and it's totally lined with lamb's wool, so it would keep her warm in Chicago winters, but it weighed 10 pounds. So if you include you know, the petticoats, the corsets, the bustles, and all the things that she wore underneath. She was wearing an additional 20 pounds of clothing when she had this coat on, which I think is interesting. Now for something about Bertha Palmer's involvement in the Chicago World's uh, Columbian Exhibition in 1893, she played a very significant role in it. Uh, she was given the honor of being the president of the board of lady managers for the exposition. And it was she who demanded and received permission to do an entire building devoted to women and their achievements. But she also wanted to highlight some of the challenges and the inequalities of women at the same time. In the middle of this slide is the official portrait of her that was made as president of this group. And on the left uh, is a portrait that she commissioned at, again, the same time by one of my favorite artists, Anders Zorn, a Swedish impressionist painter uh, who also painted her with a crown and a scepter. So she's even more royal here than in the previous portrait that we saw. So she was quite, quite the Chicago royalty. On the far right, is the bronze bas-relief sculpture commissioned by the exposition to celebrate her presidency in this committee, on this committee. And what you see here is the impressive design of the building by the architect Sophia Hayden, who unfortunately never designed another building after this one. This was the end of her career, although she was rather young. In the bottom slide, you can see the murals that were commissioned um, of Mary Cassatt. Uh, and underneath the middle panel, you can see Hayden's, the architect's uh, name. So she received uh, quite obvious um, credit for what she designed here. But 
these also do not exist. So just as the building is gone, everything in it, including Mary Cassatt's paintings are gone. As a sidelight to Bertha Palmer's involvement in this exposition and due to my, my own passion for chocolate, I have to mention that uh, Ms. Palmer decided that there should be some sort of dessert that people could buy at the exposition that could easily be carried with them and eaten as they were walking through. And so she commissioned her um, uh, chef at the Palmer House to come up with that dessert. And what he discovered was the chocolate brownie. So as we enjoy a chocolate brownie, you can think about Bertha Palmer and, and the fact that her chef had this, this culinary idea that he carried through. The Ringling Art Library has a particularly well cared for book from uh, Ms. Palmer's library. And you can see that here. And it is the book about the world's Columbian Exposition, written by Trumbull White, published in Philadelphia in 1893, with an introduction and another chapter written by Bertha Palmer as president of the Board of Lady Managers. On the right, you can see the title page with credit to Ms. Palmer. Um, what I learned from her rather lengthy chapter that I read is that she was a highly articulate woman and a very accomplished writer. About the exposition, she says, the one essential point of vantage possessed by the present World's Fair has been from the beginning, the prominence of women in the making of it, not merely as contributors to the marvelous display of genius and skill in its many grand divisions, but as a recognized executive factor invested by Congress with full authority and ample funds. And I think this is interesting that she calls it an executive factor and, and talks about the fact that it was politically funded. As I read through her section of the book, I saw a very feminist approach that showed immense pride in the accomplishments of women. And I also saw significant business acumen and a savvy knowledge of politics. She knew how to work politicians. She knew how to take care of budgets and funds and funding. Uh, and I found all of this very impressive. Um, and also she, she conveys a real delight in the coming together of so many women from around the world, probably one of, of the earlier attempts at, at networking for women. And the fact that these women were able to exchange ideas and have as what she called an official dignity. And by the way, for anybody who wants to explore, as I said, we have, we have one of the original copies in our library at the Ringling, but if you want to explore the book further, uh, it has been digitized and you can download it free on Barnes and Noble's um, website. Oh, just as a sidelight, when I first opened this book, when I came to the art library uh, in the beginning, this bookmark fell out of it. And as you can see, it was issued by the Scottish Widows Fund, obviously owned by Bertha Palmer. And I think it's just a little bit extra in a uh, little bit extra evidence to show us her concern for the financial welfare of women, because obviously she must have been involved in some way. Um, she was widowed uh, and 61 years old when she bought her property in Osprey, having seen an advertisement in the Chicago Daily Tribune for acreage on the Gulf Coast. With her usual astute business sense, she had substantially expanded the fortune left to her by her husband and decided that the west coast of Florida was the perfect place for farming and faster profits than Florida's East Coast. Apparently she had been impressed by the fact that there were so many wealthy people who had built these huge estates on the East Coast on the water, but she was more interested in, uh, well, I'm sure the beauty of our West Coast Im impressed her as well, but she was interested in what kind of income and business she could conduct on in our area. So she bought a small house on 350 acres 
on Little Sarasota Bay, and she enlarged it to include seven bedrooms and nine bathrooms. And the interior designer that she hired brought a number of her French Impressionist paintings to Sarasota. So in Little Osprey, she had hanging on her walls, Cassat, Degas, Picasso, and Monet. So not your usual house in Osprey at that time. This is the front lawn of the Oaks, her estate, with a sloping open view down to the bay. But in order to get that view, she had to have all of the mangroves uh, torn out, which of course today is a very illegal thing to do. Um, and uh, she, it was before the time when uh, Carl Bickel had written his book, The Mangrove Coast. We also have one of those uh, first editions in our rare book collection at the Ringling. So she wasn't aware of how important the ecosystem uh, is to uh, the mangrove, the mangrove ecosystem is to Florida's um, environment. Take note of the line of urns uh, following the walkway all along uh, underneath the oak trees. Uh, we don't know where these urns came from. Uh, well, I should say the original because what she had done was uh, bring an original one, we think probably from Europe, and then had uh, all of these extra ones for her gardens cast from that original one. This is a picture, two pictures from her initial visit to Sarasota. What you see on the top left is Bertha Palmer in the front, of course, as usual, elegantly dressed with, a, with her friends and family, crossing a section of what is Mayaka Park today. And on the lower right, her grandson uh, with one of the ranch hands. So she really got out there and explored her new, her new property. And this is a picture on one of Sarasota's beaches, we don't know which one, with her son Potter Palmer II and her grandson Potter Palmer III. Now to talk about some of the gardening books that we have in our collection. And I, I have to say that, that not only are many of them very rare today, but they're very beautiful books. I mean, you can see from this one that's embossed in, in gold leaf on the front and many of them are that way. So they're just a real joy to, uh, to look at. The first one is probably our most valuable book in our collection. Uh, it is Edith Wharton's Italian Villas and Their Gardens, published in 1904. Edith Wharton, the Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning American author, fell in love with Italian gardens in her early travels. And this book, her first published travel book, is a result of, of her interest in that subject. She used 300 years of written resources in four different languages for her research. And the book covers 80 villas and 60 gardens. Because of this publication, Wharton is given credit for shaping the way in which American gardens were designed. And she used the same design principles for her own garden in Lenox, Massachusetts that you see here. Her formal gardens on three acres included approximately 5,000 trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants, and nearly 3,000 annuals and perennials. And, and this, I think, uh, is what I'm about to say is relevant again to Bertha Palmer's garden, because I think she pretty much followed the same idea. But Edith Wharton's idea for garden design was that the garden should be seen as one sees a house with a series of separate rooms. And you'll see that Bertha Palmer did that uh, to some extent in her garden as well. The book was, was illustrated with watercolors and drawings by Maxfield Parrish, a very popular illustrator painter at the turn of the century, who was known for these rather dreamy, 
fairy tale like images and his also his use of a very special color of blue, which you see in, in the watercolor on the right. Um, the illustrations. Um, wait, let me I think I have two, yes, I have two more here. The one on the left is from the Villa Campi and the one on the right is from the Baboli Gardens. The book is a survey of garden architecture and the ornamentation in it, rather than a study of the villas, most of which were from the Renaissance and the Baroque periods. What she focused on was the tripartite relationship between the garden, the villa, and the landscape that surrounded it. And she also included in her book biographies of 55 uh, garden architects. In her introduction, Italian Garden Magic, Edith Wharton warns her reader not to try to reproduce the Italian gardens as seen in the book, but to use the principles they like and adapt them to the location of their own garden. She said that it is important to bring home the informing spirit, as she called it. I think that this is a concept that we can relate to Ms. Palmer's garden as she also adapted the spirit of many of these Italian gardens to her, to her own garden it's at Spanish Point, although she did not copy the gardens themselves. In a chapter called Florentine Villas, Wharton describes the Baboli Gardens extensively and points out that many of the villas outside Florence showed evidence of the Britannic craving for a lawn now we also see a large lawn area uh, in Bertha Palmer's estate, although I don't really know that this was original to it. Um, I have not been able to get that information. The gardens Wharton praised the most were those that she felt were laid out in harmony with the surrounding landscape. And again, we think of, of Bertha Palmer with her location for her home and part of her gardens uh, on top of the, the uh, shell middens with the beautiful view over the, of, over the lake or over the bay. Wharton also discusses the Tietro d'Aqua or water theater in which water splashes down through fluted basins and stone channels, a feat of hydraulic engineering she praises. We know that because we still have it in existence. Bertha Palmer created this aqueduct system in Osprey, meandering through her gardens and culminating in a fountain in the Blue Garden. In an article about the oaks that I found from House Beautiful in 1920, it said that the garden could convey someone without a shock from a jungle into a formal garden. And this is what it exact. This is exactly what it does. It takes you from uh, Bertha Palmer's garden and and aqueduct system takes you from something very jungle like and meanders through that area and then comes out in a in a more formal garden area. The aqueduct was fed by an art by several artesian wells on her property and connected the three gardens in the prop on the property. And again, this is where I was thinking about Wharton's concept of, of a series of rooms. You go from the fern garden, which you see here, <clears throat> to the jungle walk, and then ultimately ending in the blue garden. This is the trough uh, that was placed actually ground level that conveyed the water along through the, through the jungle part. And um, also the aqueduct at this point where you see the shells surrounding the end is where it begins to drop, the water begins to drop and then falls into the um, fountain that is also encrusted with these uh, various seashells. Uh, and this is where it ends, right in front of the main house where it was located. It took 15 masons working to create this system, as well as other stru stru structures and objects, and probably also the same masons that, that cast the many urns that were found along the, uh, the walkways.
looking again at Wharton's book, one of the most beautiful of the parish, wa parish watercolors is of the villa Isola Bella, the ancestral home of the Baramillo family in Lago Maggiore. You can see that the palace is at one end of the formal gardens, while the other side facing us in the water has 10 terraced gardens circling the entire end of the island. <clears throat> a bishop in the 17th century wrote this about the island. The delighting variety that is here makes it such a habitation for summer that perhaps the whole world hath nothing like it. One of the points that Wharton makes that I found interesting is that flowers played a secondary role in these Renaissance and Baroque Italian gardens, but flowers seem to have played a major role in, in Bertha Palmer's profuse, lush Florida garden, where she also grew roses, among other flowers, just as Mabel Ringland did. Oh, by the way, I should mention that the book that I just showed you uh, with the Maxwell Parish um, illustrations has also been digitized. And if you go into Google, you can Google books, you can download it there and take a closer look. I, I, I should go back here. Um, it, it really is just a matter of speculation on, on my part as to how much the photographs in these books inspired Bertha Palmer in terms of her own garden designs in Florida, or if they were just visual documentation of those places that she may have seen in Europe on her many, many trips. While going through these books about Italian gardens, I was curious as to whether she had spent much time in Italy. So I called a very helpful librarian <clears throat> as librarians tend to, to be, at the Chicago History Museum. And she was um, very helpful in searching the Chicago Tribune database for me. We discovered that Bertha Palmer had, had toured Italy on her seven month tour of Europe in 1895, where she had had an audience with the Queen of Italy. And another article that was found in the Chicago Tribune said that she entertained the nephew of the King of Italy in Newport three years later had, at her home there. So we know that she was very familiar with this part of Europe and also its gardens. The next book we'll take a look at is The Gardens of Italy by Charles Latham dedicated by special permission to His Majesty the King of Italy and published in Southampton in 1905. <clears throat> the uh, title page that you see on the right is from the second volume and we have two, both volumes in our collection at the Ringling. This is a modern photograph of the Villa Montalto in Florence perched on a hill, just like part of Barbara, I mean, excuse me, Bertha Palmer's garden that was situated atop the, um, the shell midden. This villa was sold by the widow of a noble Florentine to a relative of the early Renaissance painter Giotto, which I think is interesting. In the 19th century, it was purchased by a German count who planned the garden as we now see it in this book by Latham and he turned the olive and artichoke gardens into a rose garden with over 500 varieties of roses. And again, as Palmer's estate overlooked Little Sarasota Bay, this villa uh, in uh, Italy overlooked the, the place where Michelangelo spent his childhood that you see here in this picture. I thought it would be interesting to compare the Italian pergola from the Villa Montalto to Bertha Palmer's Oaks pergola. While the Villa Montalto has pergola has only four columns in the Corinthian style and is much smaller with a balustrade on three sides, Bertha Palmer's pergola design in this photograph of the restored structure has, I believe, eight columns in the Doric style and is open with steps 
leading up to the base. It stands in front of, uh, rather behind, a reflecting pool and has bougainvillea plants at the base of some of the columns. So the original one, uh, we, uh, we, there is a very old photograph of it, but it's, it's difficult to see what it looked like. So this one has been as closely restored as possible. And it's just an absolute lovely sight uh, looking over the bay. Again, from Latham's, Latham's Gardens of Italy, we see the West Gate from the Boboli Gardens, a property sold to Eleonora de' Medici, widow of Cosimo I in 1549. From these gardens, you can see all of Florence, including Il Duomo, the cathedral. The gates display a set of double freestanding Doric columns with an architrave um, on which there appear to be gazelle-like animals. And please take note of the fountain behind the gates because I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. The Boboli Gate seems to relate to the Oaks Duchenne Lawn built in 1915, named after a French garden designer, um, Achilles Duchenne, who, who mentions Palmer's garden in his own book about gardens. And we see the same idea of the double columns, but this time with a wide expanse of lawn on the other side, um, creating a kind of classic portal that seems to open a wonderful vista that goes all the way back to the jungle. So I couldn't help but relate the fountain to uh, the one that we have at the Ringling uh, in our very own courtyard where we see uh, Guillaume Bologna's fountain on the Isolotto with Oceanus on top. So this, this is a much copied fountain and we can see it in our own uh, Ringling. And here is our copy. Another connection to the Ringling Museum is the Villa Lante's Fountain of the River Gods. Uh, one, of, one of the sources that I read about this that, are, that is included in the Latham book said, this garden exudes pagan sensuality. So this might be a, a good example of that sensuality with these reclining half nude gods with their flowing hair. And of course, Italian gardens often have much to do with drama and theater. And this is a good example of that. But at our own Ringling Museum, we have our fountain below David and uh, we have two river gods present there. A very pretty little book in Bertha Palmer's collection is The Language of Flowers, illustrated by Kate Greenaway and printed in England in 1900. Kate Greenaway, as I'm sure you, you know, was an illustrator of children's books in England uh, who always included children in beautiful clothing. Uh, and in, in fact, she created such lovely designs for the, fab, the fabric that Liberty of London uh, copied a number of them for their, for their own fabrics. This particular book is a collection of flowers arranged much like a 17th century emblem book. So it includes a picture, a poem, and usually conveys a moral lesson, lesson of some kind. Here we see um, on the page that is devoted to the wild grape, a woman giving alms to the poor. So somehow this poem relates, relates the grapes to that idea and we see it illustrated here. And then we have this one um, that concerns moss and relates moss to maternal love. Another of Bertha Palmer's books in our library and one that has an absolutely stunning binding on it, again with embossed gold leaf designs, uh, very beautifully made, uh, is actually where I got the uh, inspiration for the title of this talk. And it's called, uh, the, the title is long. The Parks, Promenades and Gardens of Paris, 
described and considered in relation to the wants of our own cities and of public and private gardens. It was published in London in 1860. And this book was written by W. Robinson, a correspondent for the Times in London for the horticulture department of the great Paris ex exhibition where he was sent to, uh, to cover what was going on. The purpose of the book is to describe the progress of our neighbors and our neighbors being the French in, in city improvements, giving a detailed account of the production of the most important fruits and vegetables for the Paris market. So it has kind of an interesting slant to it. And the, re the result of this is a rather odd blend of a description and discussion of famous gardens and parks in Paris and a how-to book about how to grow fruit. So interesting uh, approach for this one. Another book that we got from the Palmer Library are, and we have two copies of this, is a book called Old Time Gardens Newly Set Forth, a book of the sweet of the year by Alice Morse Earle published in 1901. And this, this is an intriguing book, as is the author. Uh, she was an American historian who was accused of writing pots and pans histories of colonial life. Uh, of the 17 books that she wrote, some were quite sweet, like this one, and others were just downright bizarre. She wrote one that I'm, I'm glad to say we don't have in our library, was about skin branding punishments for lawbreakers. So it was a rather grotesque subject. So she, she <laughs> had an interesting uh, uh, array of interests. But in contrast, as I said, this particular book is actually very sweet, although not very realistic in terms of its portrayal of rural life. Um, there are chapters called Comfort Me With Apples, and, um, and another one, for example, Tussy Mussies, which in case you don't know, is a bouquet of flowers mingled with sweet smelling leaves, uh, an idea that comes from uh, medieval England. And there's also a long chapter devoted to sundials. But as you can see from this photograph in the book, it's, it has a very, in addition to having a very poetic sort of flowery style and tone to it, there are all these photographs of gardens from the United States at the end of the 19th century, and they're all much like this one. They're obviously staged. They uh, are, are meant to look too good to be true um, and, and, and just not um, an adequate portrayal of what gardens looked like um, around the rural um, countryside, but, but interesting to look at on the last And here is the third edition of The Formal Garden in England, written by Reginald Bloomfield, published in London in 1901. The author, an architect, was criticized for writing, writing this book in 1892, since it was not considered proper for an architect to write about gardens, even though garden design was a hot topic at this time in history. He continued to write and his numerous books on the history of architecture led to his involvement in the preservation of many, many important 17th and 18th century buildings. He was an Oxford graduate in classics, wrote in a very scholarly manner, and he in himself admits that, and I'm quoting, garden design is seen as merely literary material and appears to possess a dangerous fascination for writers with a turn for pretty sentiment rather than for exact habits of thought. And that's much like, I think, what we saw in Alice Earle's uh, Old Time Gardens book. The thesis of Bloom Bloomfield's book is that while his contemporaries in England were technically talented, they had forgotten the architectural and aesthetic sense seen in earlier centuries when the connection to all of the arts was taken into consideration. He cites a debate from the end of the 19th century 
that centered on the landscape gardeners complaint that architects knew nothing about gardening and the architects complained that gardeners knew nothing about design. Most of the designs such as these were of formal gardens in England with a few lovely drawings of various rural locations such as this one of the Yew Walk in Derbyshire. I thought about Bertha Palmer when the author wrote, indeed, the danger at this moment is that in our admiration for certain beautiful old gardens, we should attempt to reproduce them blindly under impossible conditions. There are sites which make a purely formal garden out of the question and others in which even if it were possible, it would not be desirable. Um, Bertha Palmer utilized certain classical and formal elements of garden design, such as the urns, columns, pergola, etc. But she never attempted to reproduce the formal European garden. She understood the natural beauty of our Florida environment and her property on Little Sarasota Bay. So, my observation is that she accepted the elements of the subtropical Florida and blended the best of both. Uh, I would like to say that uh, when the library does open at some point and we are comfortable um, being in, in that space again, uh, if anyone would like to see Bertha Palmer's library, you are most welcome. Just give me a call and we can make an appointment uh, we can also arrange um, a small group to go up at one time and, and to peruse these volumes, or I can bring them down to the reading room. So I think you'll, I think you would enjoy looking at them. They're quite a treasure. And uh, so you're most welcome to do that. So uh, having said that, should we open it up, uh, Laura, to uh, comments or questions? Sure. So uh, if you have any questions, you can either send them via the chat or just unmute yourself and we'd be happy to take those. Uh, can you hear me? This yes, we can. Is, uh, Yaniski. I just wanted to thank this presenter. She did such an amazing job and I came in slightly late. Can you tell me what her name is? My name? Yes. Oh, it's Elisa Hansen and I am the head of the library services at the Ringling Art Library. Oh, it was just wonderful. I especially thank love you. that coat weighed 10 pounds, <laughs> like that was great. She, she had gorgeous clothes for sure. Oh yes, just wonderful. And I just, thank you so much. She does a wonderful job. I'd love to have part two, if you have time to do another segment, because I know there's a lot of other material I'm sure that you could cover easily. Well, you know, there, there we have a very rich and varied rare book collection. And uh, there's just so much up, in that vault upstairs above the library. So uh, there's there there are, there's a lot of material we could cover. So we could certainly arrange to have another talk on uh, another time for sure. There is, and you know, now with Zoom, even though the COVID has been a big hassle for everyone, Zoom has been wonderful because people can join in from all over, you know, and then because you've re recorded this, we can go back and, and we can listen to it. So it's it's had some real pluses. Glad to hear it. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Elisa, we got a question from the chat. Wonderful present presentation. Thanks very much. Just curious, do you know if Frederick Law Olmsted and Bertha Palmer had any connections? You know, that's a really interesting question that I never thought about. I, I don't know. Um, it, that would be worth researching for sure. That could be a very interesting uh, subject to look further into. Thank you for that. Any other questions from the group? You can chat or unmute whatever you want. Well, at least I think you gave them a very comprehensive presentation. Nobody has any questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think of any, don't hesitate to, uh, to uh, write to me at the Ringling and I will answer you. And, and if I don't know the answer, I'll try and find out. So, uh, so please. Oh, I, I, have, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Now that historic Spanish point is owned by the Selby Gardens. Um, is there any collaboration now between the Ringling and Selby? Because the Ringling has all of the documents and books 
are you all doing any kind of uh, collaboration? I, it ha we haven't discussed that, but I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, I will certainly pursue that. I, I, uh, yes, because they have an incredible little library at Selby and, and they have the archives at Spanish Point. So uh, a little consortium of Bertha Palmer uh, resources, I think would be a splendid idea. Thank you. For it that. really would. It would yeah. be great. And if there's it any would. books that could be on uh, display there, uh, maybe not, you know, the whole collection, but they have a small house there that they do have some books open. I don't know if you've been down there recently or not. So, um, well, that, I think that's a great idea. And next time you're in the library, when we're open, we have two display cases in the front, in the foyer, when you come into the library that has material and, uh, from Bertha Palmer's collection. Um, yeah. so you can always take a look at that as well. Great. And Elisa, while we were talking, we had a few more questions come through the chat. Do you know anything about her home in Lenox? Is it a public museum or is it private? I, I believe it is a, a historic home that you can tour. Yes. Um, and did they bring gardeners from Chicago or did they hire locally? Do you know? Oh, that's an interesting question. I never thought about that. My guess would be local. Uh, they, she certainly brought her designer in, but... Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I hate to monopolize, but I did want to mention when we went down to his, his historic Spanish point, there's a very large urn there that they actually brought from the Chicago house to, to the point. Did you know that? I didn't. And that, yeah. could, that could be the original from which all those others were cast. It is. It is. Mystery. Well, I don't know. This is a very large one. It was very huge. And it was in, in front of their house in, in, in the um, uh, Chicago mansion. So, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Wow. That's, yeah, I, would, I wish we had that house still. I, I don't know the story of what happened to it or why it was raised but it, it, it would be lovely. If we oh, I know. We were yeah. very disappointed when we heard that it's not there anymore. <laughs> I know, but it's a great place to visit, isn't it? And I think, Elisa, just echoing calls for, you know, you're backed by popular demand. Uh, there is a question, will there be any further details or education on Bertha and her ranching and other enterprises? So I think we, we could do a whole Bertha 2.0 uh, program. It seems like there's a lot of interest. Oh, yes. So something Good. to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Elisa, for sharing your expertise with us. And thank you all for participating. It was lovely to see you. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again at a virtual program soon, or maybe even in person when it's safe. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. It was excellent.